everybody and welcome to today's edition of Sheffield Steel, the lockdown interviews where we speak to business owners from around the region to hear their story of their lockdown, what it was like for them, what did, what did they do. I'm really pleased to have Jane McNeese here, who's the owner of uh, Mind Matters. Jane, welcome to the call today. Morning, uh, John. Thank you for inviting me for the interview. No problems. I, I love doing these because um, it's been a really interesting time that not many people shared all the same journey all at the same time. We're all on different paths. But in the last 100 days, everybody's kind of been on the same journey, doing it in their own different ways. So I love doing these interviews. So obviously I know a little bit about you. Um, maybe it would be a good opportunity for you to just introduce yourself, who you are, what you do, and a little bit about the background of your business. Okay, so my name is Jane McNeese. I'm owner of a company called Mind Matters. We're based in South Yorkshire in Barnsley, but we deliver nationwide and on occasion we deliver internationally as well. Principally, we deliver mental health training courses. Uh, we deliver a number of products that people might be aware of. So we deliver things like mental health first aid. We also provide a number of suicide prevention training courses. So we deliver things like the applied suicide intervention skills and safe talk. We deliver uh, IACT courses for managers. So um, in a way, we deliver training courses that meet all parts of workplace communities and also communities in which people live. So if you're a manager, we've got a course that will help you to um, identify signs and symptoms in your staff and have the knowledge and confidence to support your staff members. If you're an employee, we can help you with that too. Now, we all knew that we were in a, in a health pandemic, probably towards the back end of February, definitely towards the early March. But we then found out, um, probably over the next couple of months, is that we were in, in an economic recession as well as a pandemic. And I think, and I've spoke to you about this personally, and I've also spoke to a lot of people about it, but we're also going to have some issues with mental health as well coming out the other side of this through um, so, sort of the lockdown period, people not being able to see friends and family. Um, I've had a few conversations with the charity mind and their phones are off the hook right now. So um, we'll definitely talk, talk about that as part of the interview. But to start off with, maybe the first question is, at what point in time did you realise there was going to be some issues commercially? Obviously, with you being a training provider, I'm assuming lots of your business was doing face-to-face -face training. And, yes. so at what point in time did you realise there was going to be an issue commercially? I would say it was possibly the sort of first first week of March, I think. I'd picked up on a few things on Twitter, um, kind of leaked information from health and social care in other countries. And it, there was a and different graphs and bits of evidence I'd seen that pretty much told me things were going to hit the floor. I was near certain of that the second week of March. Um, as a company, we exhibited at the Health and Wellbeing at Work conference in Birmingham. And I was there with another colleague and I, I was quite sort of apprehensive about it all. I could see it coming. Um, I think even at a point when other people around me were, were I think perceiving me as perhaps overreacting. I tend to be a planner, I tend to be a little bit risk averse. So I, I felt like I'd seen this coming. Um, I'd done a few maths things, worked out you know, what it meant for us, because at this point we didn't know what the government provision would be as well. So I had to factor in literally what's in the bank and how long can we last? So um, by and large, we deliver face-to-face -face training. That was going to stop and it stopped fast. Yeah, it was the same with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I know I've spoken to a couple of people as part of these interviews where literally their business was just pulled from, pulled from one of them just yeah. on, on one day. Their whole business model in regards to development and growth just was completely, completely shook. So obviously a lot of your training was done face to face. So how, how did you adapt? What, what is it that you've had to change? The challenge that we had is a lot of the training courses that Mind Matters delivers are off the shelf products. I don't produce them. They are produced by uh, governing and hosting organisations. So, for example, if I deliver a mental health first aid course, I am delivering a product of Mental Health First Aid England. If I'm delivering Assist, I'm delivering a product of Living Works who are based in Canada. I cannot alter those products. I cannot adapt them for online delivery. And the re there's a reason that we go down the route of online products because they are robust, they are evidence-based, and they've had a lot of collaboration to bring them together. So I'm a big believer in don't reinvent the wheel on, on training products when there's some really good stuff out there, and that's why we deliver those. So I couldn't simply take those and deliver them online. So there was an element of waiting. There was a, a, a significant element of shift in my personal life so schools started to close down so as a parent I had that um, double challenge of 
how do I manage uh, the business as well as being a good parent and, and trying to, to manage both? So for me, uh, because I had to shift to wholly parenthood, a lot of the business stuff, it had slowed down anyway, but I couldn't really drive it or do anything with it. So I had a good month where it was, it was dormant. At that point, the government started to announce what they could do to support us as a business. You make a great point. And I don't think anybody's brought that up as part of the lockdown interview so far, but the fact that the schools all, all, all of a sudden, what was it, the 23rd of March, I think it was the 23rd of March, when yes. all the schools closed their doors. So by the time that they go back, it's been nearly six months that the children, that kids have just been, been at home. Uh, and as a business owner, juggling that must have been really difficult for you. Yeah, uh, first and foremost, I'm a parent. Um, I always say my business is a bit like my fourth child. It demands as much energy as well. Um, but I think there was things I had to consider about being a female business owner as well. I've never felt impacted by an by being a female business owner but I think that felt a little bit more pronounced during this time I felt like the male trainers and business owners had potential to get ahead of me and I'm not saying that men don't play a part in parenthood but I think we still live in a society where that is largely the domain of females but not in all cases admittedly and um, so I think for me actually it really pronounced things like that and I think that's what the uh, pandemic has done it's pronounced uh, inequalities, it's pronounced challenges, and I've, I've felt that too as a business owner. It's a, it's a great point that you raise. So in, instead of going to the next part of the interview, let me just ask you a little bit more about your opinion on a few things, if that's all right. Mm -hmm. um, so we spoke a little bit earlier on about sort of pandemic and the economic recession, and, and I really do think that as a society, we're going to see the impact of, of mental health, um, maybe not instantaneously in the next couple of months, but definitely, in my opinion, over a longer period of time. What are your thoughts on that? Um, I would echo that. And, and I don't think it takes uh, too much thinking to anticipate that we are going to see increases. And in fact, John, they're already there. We're already seeing research taking place by uh, people at the Centre for Mental Health and Mind and other organisations. Their wellbeing in indexes showing that mental health problems are increasing and particularly things like anxiety. I've seen research that is focused on particular localities in Yorkshire and Humber, looking at children's mental health, parents' mental health. And we're already seeing it, it's already increasing but I don't think that would be difficult to predict anyway um, I think the key area may well be around anxiety but I suspect we might see higher levels of depression and unfortunately if we start to see higher levels of depression the crisis situation associated with that tends to be suicide so we we potentially may well see an increase in suicide as a result of the pandemic as well yeah and also one thing to to also consider, which not a lot of people be, will actually be aware of, but there's certain mental health drugs that are, that are on the marketplace to deal with anxiety and depression, which actually got cut. I don't know whether you're aware of this um, in March because they were manufactured in China. Ah, I didn't so know. They couldn't, yeah, so um, they couldn't get distribution mm -hmm. because where the, where the distribution factories were closed down. And then when it opened again, they trebled the price. It completely stopped. I can't remember the, the name, um, the exact name of which one it was. But yeah, and, and there was just people going, well, what do I do? I can't get to the doctors because the doctors are closed. If you don't have internet, you can't have an internet, you'd like a consultation. So it put lots of people in a really tough predicament. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so do you think it, it just won't be sort of um, suicide that we we're going to see, unfortunately, increase throughout the next few months? But I would say that the biggest one is going to be that anxiety because, yeah, and, and I'm not here to, to blame the government for anything because um, it's really interesting that we all make mistakes every single day. Every day we make mistakes in business. Gosh, I can't count on fingers, toes, hairs on my head how many mistakes I've made. When you're in government, everything's highlighted every single day. So if you make a mistake, it affects a lot more people. So, and I've got a record to say from a, from an economical standpoint, they did as much as they possibly could um, but looking at looking at this going forward the, the message has definitely been stay inside if you go outside you're going to die mm -hmm. to go to a restaurant and it's almost sent very quick that transition um, which I think has played a lot on and, and maybe even highlighted to people that they do have anxiety issues that they never really knew they had before so it's those underlying health conditions. 
Yeah. It's important to say, first of all, on anxiety, we've all experienced it. doesn't mean we have an anxiety disorder. If you have a job interview or a lockdown interview, it might provoke those levels of anxiety. That is normal and that is healthy. So we're not necessarily looking at an anxiety disorder there. But I do certainly think it's one area of mental health we are likely to see increase. But I, I suspect we will see increases in all areas of, of mental health. Just to go back to your point around, uh, obviously, obviously, medication, we start to see, obviously, there the economic and pandemic impact of uh, on the pharmaceutical industry. But it's important to say around mental health as well that um, medication is only one aspect of the recovery or mental health maintenance. There's a lot around lifestyle. There's a lot around uh, the psychological side of things, things like talking therapies. But for some people, medication is a big part of their mental health management. And without it, it could exacerbate or bring about another episode of poor mental health. There's also studies on, on health as well, health and uh, mental well-being the, the healthier you are the better the diet the yeah. better your mental well-being is as well so so for those people that might be listening to go you know what I, i've had some anxiety bouts over the past few weeks what understanding that's perfectly normal is really important to understand yeah. in times of change in times of crisis it's okay to be uncertain i mean it yeah. this challenge gives uncertainty so it's okay to feel that way is there any tips from a, from a training perspective that you could potentially give to say, look, if you're feeling anxious about something, here are some top tips on how to manage that to the best of your ability? Okay, well, there's a few things to consider, first of all. So as we've said, anxiety is an, a normal human response, and it goes back to when we were cave people, fight, flight, so freeze, or fight, flight, freeze, or flop, depending on which theories you go down. Um, but when we're shifting from anxiety to an anxiety disorder, we need to measure three things. What a GP or a clinical professional is looking for is they're looking to find out how long that's been going on for. So if we had a job interview today at three o'clock, it might be quite normal to start feeling anxious. If you are still feeling anxious after the interview this time next week, we wouldn't regard that as normal anxiety. So we're looking for longevity, number one. The second one is severity. So how severe are the symptoms you're having? Is it affecting digestive system? Are you having great difficulties with that? Are you having severe migraines? What are the physical and, and consequences of that? Are you having panic attacks on a regular basis? And the third one is impact on your day-to-day -day living. Is it stopping you going to work, running your business effectively, looking after your responsibilities, getting a good night's sleep? And that's when we shift towards an anxiety disorder. So we need to manage that where that's the case. And yes, sometimes we do medicate, uh, use medication to do that. A GP may well prescribe that. But we also need to look at things like lifestyle. So it could be simply about looking at something like sleep hygiene. What time do I go to bed? Do I put my technology down an hour before I go to bed or do I put it down 30 seconds before I hit the pillow? So actually trying to get a good night's sleep. Things like exercise, and I don't necessarily mean going out and doing a 10K run three days a week, simply taking your lunch away from your workstation and going for a walk, getting outdoors, getting some light. And it's very often that it's those small things that combine to maintain good mental, uh, good mental well-being. In society, we talk a lot about poor mental health. It's important to say, if we are truly to resolve mental health difficulties, we need to understand what good mental health looks like. So if you are in a good place at the moment, how do you keep it that way? The same way you might apply that to your physical health. So if you're in a good place, what are you doing? What can you do to improve it if you're not? We've got lots of resources on the Mind Matters website, which you can have a look, lots of self-help materials. We'd also encourage having a look online at places like Every Mind Matters, uh, Mind, the national charity. There's so many support materials out there that you can actually use in a self-help capacity. I love what you just said there. Um, because anxiety is, even with people that have an anxiety disorder, an anxiety issue, is not ever present. It's no. not 24 hours a day, seven days a week, but it could be for a sustained period of time, like a three hour panic attack. But also there are days and there are times where people, and I know lots of people with anxiety, it's a, it's a common, common thing now that's been uh, diagnosed. So, and it, it's almost like some days are absolutely fine. And I love what you said about understanding, well, what have you been doing at that point in time? Because it's something that you're doing to make you feel good and highlighting that and being aware of it and, and making sure that you're doing that for future practice is so, so important. So I love what you said there. Yeah. So, 
sometimes it does take more, more management than others. Some people will reach a recovery point where they do find they are symptom free and it's gone away. And some people will be left with residual symptoms that they might have to manage for the rest of their days. I include myself in that. I have an anxiety diagnosis. It is a work in progress and it's been a work in progress pretty much forever. Um, so I manage the residual symptoms and I live it with an acceptance that uh, being symptom free may not ever happen. Um, so I didn't come to mind matters and the work I do by accident. I came to it because I have my own lived experience of and family experiences of poor mental health, which is the, the case for many people who work in this field. And, and that really comes through that you're talking from not just from the head, but also from the heart as well. And I'm a big believer that that's a, that's a massive part to anybody's success. It's okay if it makes economical sense, but how much do you really care about this stuff is really going to mean whether you make it or not. And um, so obviously some of the things that were happening in your industry, your hands were tied, you know, your training programs were, you delivered training programs in, on, part, on behalf of other people. So you couldn't really just change protocol, change programs and go online. So what things did you do that were in your control? Did you spend some more time thinking about, thinking about the business in regards to working on it? What, what adaptations did you make? I think, first of all, I learned something about myself as a business owner. I learned during lockdown that I'd been doing too much, perhaps too much training and actually needed to spend a little bit more time on the management of the business. Um, so actually having that time out, first of all, gave me ideas. It, it kind of rejuvenated my creativity, which I didn't actually recognize that had been lost over the last few years because I've been doing quite a lot. Um, so that was really helpful in terms of um, going forward. Much like us as a company, other companies started to adapt. They knew, like myself, if we didn't do something, we may not be here at the end of it. And I think what we saw was a lot of training um, providers, a lot of owners of training products working to ad adapt those quickly, possibly for two reasons. Firstly, for um, business sustainability on their part, but also because I think they knew people needed this now. They needed that mental health support and knowledge. So what we started to see is some of the products that we deliver, for example, mental health first aid products, actually shifting to being able to be delivered online. And actually now we've got quite a few different products there that we can deliver in that way. We also, as a company, I've been exploring a new training product called I act uh, uh, positive mental health and I'd met with this company at the health and wellbeing at work conference in Birmingham and the plan was to actually upskill to deliver that but in due course I think was was the plan that got accelerated quite quickly because they launched an online product so part of the the time has been spent upskilling upskilling in online training products thinking about ideas bringing back to the table ideas that I had two years ago that fell by the wayside due to lack of time and actually feel really optimistic about new plans, things that might evolve and come to fruition in the next couple of years. It's difficult times still, I'm not taking that away. We have got to rebuild the business at the same time as doing that. But I actually feel like I've been given the gift of time. I didn't feel that way about it at the beginning. I was resentful, I was angry. I was thinking my business is going to the wall. So I had a week where I was really challenged from my own mental health point of view. And then I also, I almost hit acceptance and we moved forward once we reached that point. There's almost that enrichment that's coming through as you're talking as well. So um, lots of people are gonna take a lot from that. And look, it's very easy to get caught up in today's media. Hmm. Today's media um, is about selling, selling what is easily sold. And unfortunately, that's fear. So there is a lot of scaremongering out there in the media. And we don't hear enough of this about people going, yeah, all right, well, GDP is down by 20%, but I feel like I've been given the gift of time. I mean, that's quite, that's a massive thing to take away. So you've clearly made some adjustments in the last, uh, in the last three months. And like you said, we're not out of it yet. Uh, hate to go down the scam on Grim route, but I would say that the next 100 days are going to be even more tested than the yeah. previous 100 days. Um, if you look at it from an economic standpoint, the last 100 days, although um, trading has eased, people, the general public have actually had more money than, than they would have the previous 100 days because mortgage free, um, credit cards on stock, uh, no fuel bills because we were all at home. Um, so all of a sudden, people have got different habits in regards to spending, which, I mean, if, if they hadn't done the furlough scheme, if they hadn't done the mortgage scheme, heaven forbid what that 20% would look like. So the next 100 days is going to be different where people are going to be paying their mortgages again. Credit card payments will now be due. There's that 
going back to work element. So we're now spending more money through eating during the day and MOTs are now due, so that's now going to be paid and fuel. So the next 100 days is going to be definitely interesting. So look, based on the adjustments that you've made in the last 100 days, what are you going to keep on doing? So the, the lessons that you kind of learn about yourself, what are you going to make sure continues through the next 100 days? I'm absolutely resolute, really, that I'm not going to go back to three days of training or delivering two or three courses a week. My intention is to still keep delivering training um, because I do enjoy it and I'm passionate about mental health. But a lot of my time now will be devoted towards um, strategy and management and actually looking at these ideas that kind of fell by the wayside. Now I've got to balance that against cash flow as well. If I deliver a course myself, then we generate a greater income than if I use an associate trainer. And we do have a really wide pool of excellent associate trainers who are very qualified, very experienced in the field. And we've had that pool for quite some time and we do use that from time to time. But on the whole, I delivered a majority of the training, but that's gonna change albeit within the balance of cash flow as well as we're building things back. So I think the thing is a mindset for me. It's a mindset to stick to that plan um, and also look at new plans for the business as well. But I will have more of the time to do that, whereas that, as I say, has fell by the wayside. So more focus on being the owner of Mind Matters versus yeah. just the trainer within Mind Matters. Yeah, and I think, John, you've been part of that mental shift as well. Um, I think when I spoke to you, first of all, it was quite early days in, in my thinking. And I, I was probably, from a mood point of view, my mood was still quite low around the future. There's been a significant shift with that. It's always difficult to sustain because it is going to be challenging times. And I don't think it's about fear mongering. I think it's about being real. I think it's about being realistic. Um, and if we can know what's or have a good prediction of what's there, we can work with that. So I'm a big believer of uh, trying to follow my intuition. It's not often wrong, but my failure is I forget to listen to it at times. Yeah, I think what, what's really important is, um, look, the reality of the situation is we're in recession. Hmm. And um, it's going to be a big one. Now, that doesn't mean that's actually bad news. Um, because in, I say this quite a lot, in every challenge, there's opportunities and danger. Hmm. So... Being in a recession, the important thing is to be aware of it. What we don't know now is what kind of recession we're in. Mm -hmm. uh, because there's four kinds of recessions. I don't know whether you know about the four kinds of recessions. I don't know that four, much, John. <laughs> there's, only, there's four types of recessions. Now, what we all want is what's called a V recession, which is a sharp decline and a sharp increase starting after. That's what we're all, we're all hoping. And I think we've got 100 days max to prove that. If we do get lots more localized lockdowns, that's just not going to be, that's just not going to happen. And we could see an even greater dip than 20% in the next trading quarter if, if more lockdowns happen. And I think the government are aware of that. And that's the reason why they're trying to get people out because the economic burden is almost going to be as severe as the health burden uh, going forward as well. So that, that's the one that that we want the most. The other one's the W or the double dip, which is what we had in 2008, which, which was a sharp decline. Generally, we, we did a bit of quantity easing, which made money more accessible, but unfortunately that didn't work and we went back down again. I think what we're actually in for is a U, which is a sharp decline, so maybe another 20%, awful to say, but probably another 20%, and a prolonged period down the bottom before we then take that incline and we have that for a sustained period of time. Recessions aren't new. If you look at um, finances over the past 100 years, every 10 to 20 years we have a recession and then we have a boom time. The problem that we have is that business owners aren't educated about this stuff. You're not told when you start a business. Just to let you know, there's going to be a recession in approximately four years. So now you're in the summer. Mm. So enjoy your glasses last. Make sure that you've got plenty of cash reserves because in four years' time, you're going to need them. Mm -hmm. Everybody tells us that. So people that have been trading their business for the last couple of years have literally been trading in a boom time where money was easily accessible for people. Spending was at the highest rates it probably ever has been. And in a recession, buyer habits change. And you've got to be prepared for that. And the last recession, which nobody wants, um, is an L recession which is a sharp decline, and it just stays there. And if you look at um, the housing market, the housing market has very much done that since 2006. 
So over the last 15 years, house prices have stayed the same. Now for people in property, there's been different ways to make money. So uh, uh, renting and um, prices have gone up, so you can get more bang for your buck from renting. But if you bought a house in 2006, you're lucky to get a 10% increase in that net. Whereas if you look at the previous 14 years, so if you bought a house in 92 and sold it in 2006, you probably doubled, maybe trebled your money. Mm. So the property is kind of taken an out. So pray for a V, probably going to be in you. So uh, yeah, but not many people know about this stuff, like, like in mental health. You don't realise stuff. I think, I think my intuition would go towards a, a, a you within that. The one thing I would say, though, about recession, I read something a few years ago. I, I don't feel always that recession is an in- inevitable thing every 20 years because I, I think it's Australia that have gone the longest without one. So there's something other countries are doing right that we might be getting wrong. don't know what that is. I'm not an expert in that field. Maybe we should always go and move to Australia. That seems like the answer. It's not a bad, bad place to go. It's not. Unfortunately, Australia has a, a high suicide rate. No way, really? No, uh, from what I understand, uh, they do have a high suicide rate. Um, so mental health first aid was actually developed in Australia, and that was one of the reasons behind it. As I understand it, the suicide rate is high amongst Aboriginal communities. Right. So highly discriminated against, so it's put their overall rate of suicide up. And again, that's something that a lot of people don't know about Australia because we have an idealistic view of Australia, perhaps. Absolutely. Right, okay, so uh, my favourite my favorite questions. Um, so three quick five questions for you. I appreciate that your hands were tied with a lot of the stuff, but if you could go back to the 1st of March, knowing what you know now, what would you have done sooner? Oh my goodness, that's a big question, John. It's okay to say actually nothing, but... If I'd have known what was coming, uh, I actually don't know. I don't know what I would have done. Okay. Um, next question. Now we're in we're in an interesting period of post lockdown. So I'm gonna I'm gonna change my question here because when I first started doing these, we were in lockdown mode right, where everything was closed. You couldn't go to a restaurant. Um, the most exciting time that anybody had was going to the house, but exciting or scary, both both the same kind of thing. And um, I'm not gonna say post lockdown. I'm gonna say when all this is over. And we've got some normality back in our lives and going to see loved ones and hugging our friends is, is the norm again. What are you most looking forward to when all this is over? I'm looking forward to a proper catch up with my family. It's my dad's uh, 70th birthday on the 21st of August. So that I'm, I'm looking forward to for him and for us as well on a personal level. Um, I'm looking forward to being able to travel more comfortably again. Uh, we've had a, a few travel plans impacted this year. I should have been in Zanzibar with my family right now. So um, I'm not bitter. <laughs> I'm not bitter because we are going away uh, locally for a few days uh, tomorrow. So, you know, these things happen. It, it's not the end of the world. But I am looking forward to being able to travel more comfortably on a, on a global level. I don't know what that will look like. Um, I'm looking forward to that. Travel's one of my other passions uh, alongside mental health. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. Ditto. Family holidays are really important to me. I think you, you learn more about yourself and your children on that two weeks away yeah. than you do on the previous three, four months yeah. uh, when you're not away. So uh, yeah, we had that discussion uh, as a family and said, even if the restrictions of travel get pulled down we're probably we're not going to go this year because it wouldn't be a holiday you know it's just not a holiday isn't it you can't be fun and loving and free whilst wearing a mask socially distancing and worrying about what's going on and do we share the pool and stuff like that so when all this is back to normal we'll definitely enjoy some travel again and my favorite question of all these interviews jane is what have you learned about yourself what what lesson can you take from this for you personally um what have you learned during this time I've learned that I have worked a little bit harder than I've played. And actually the play is not just a leisure thing. It's about being more creative. All of those things are stifled when we we work too hard. And I've been guilty of throwing my heart and my soul into my business. And, And my argument for that is there's work to be done. There's people out there who are suffering with poor mental health. And as long as that's the case, I will continue to, to work hard to, make changes and and bring about a better world in respect of that 
But at the same time, I think what I've been reminded of is that I matter within that picture as well. And I need to take good care of myself. And actually, I'll be able to do those things better um, because of that. So a, a lot about self-care and, and seeing where I fit into this picture. Um, something I've also learned from you, John, as well, is that, you know, it's it's not a bad thing to... Uh, bring in the right amount of money for the work that we do and that even if you're trying to make a positive difference to the world from a if you like social entrepreneurial point of view um, we still do need to make sure that the cash flows we do still need to have a little bit of a money mindset within that and I think that's um, where I'd fell down a little bit as well so there's been a, a real mindset shift if anything on, on a few different areas love that um, and to say finally thank you very much for, for sharing your experience through Sheffield Steel the lockdown lessons we're now going to call them the lessons of lockdown so thanks so much jane how can people get in touch with you by the way who's your target demographic uh, we target everyone you've all got mental health we've all got mental health like we've got physical health so anyone and everyone we work with large businesses we work with small businesses we work with individuals who are interested in coming on our courses and we work nationwide and internationally where we're asked to do so we've got a website which is www.mindmatterstraining.co.uk we are on linkedin we're on twitter we're on instagram we're on all the popular places to be and uh, we do try and be social with people and we're always here to talk to if people uh, need support and help or directing in the right way we can help there you go everybody knows where to go so thanks ever so much jane and i'll definitely see you on the other side thank you very much john